we're now being recorded. And hopefully the agenda is being displayed for your delight. Uh, Watson lad has agreed to take some notes for us, which is, which is great. Thanks, Watson. Um, and I asked Watson not to take verbatim notes, but just to note any actions. And feel free to help him in the Etherpad with notes as well uh, at the bottom. Okay, so that's three minutes past. Uh, so like I say, we, we don't have a Jabber room because we're not an ITF working group. We're an IAB program, which is a little bit different. Uh, but we can use the WebEx chat and the Etherpad. Um, Etherpad is for notes, so don't mess it up too much. And maybe use the WebEx chat for any chit chat. Uh, I don't know if we'll need to run a mic line or not. Uh, if it starts to get confusing as to who wants to talk, then we can use the plus Q minus Q convention that ITF working groups have been using for remote access meetings. Um, so feel free to use that convention if you want to come in. We uh, so I'm just looking at the agenda, which I hope is being displayed on your screens. And is there any agenda bashing? You are not screen sharing. Oh, okay. Let me try and screen share. Oh, I guess when I hit the recording, it turns off. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, so there's screen, sh screen sharing should reappear in a second. You. Great. Okay, so now you should be able to see the agenda, and now is a good time to bash the agenda if you need to. Uh, I think we have two hour slot, but I hope we don't take two hours. So maybe an hourish, but we'll see. Um, okay, so any agenda bash? We basically have a bunch of chats about the drafts and then some planning. There is no agenda bashing. Uh, just to check then, uh, Mark is here, I see. Uh, do we have Dominique? I, I presume it's Dominique to talk to the other two drafts in the middle. Yep, I'm here. Excellent, and I presume you'd like to chat about them, so that's good. And I think Yari's gonna cover ours at the end, which should be kind of brief, because not much has happened. And with that, and with no agenda bashing, I'll switch over to some slides that Mark had prepared. So one second while I swap. Is that the right one? Hey, Mark. I look, if you just, uh, whenever you want me to go to the next slide, just tell me to do that. Okay, well, let's try it now. Um, perfect. So I, I promise this will be short. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I added uh, six slides to the otherwise lightweight uh, session here. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, kind of informational. This is a draft that attempts to... Um, uh, identify classes of endpoints. That's the idea behind it. Uh, primarily, the idea is it's it's part of a, another effort that's going on uh, to um, basically establish the capabilities and limitations of endpoint only security. That's that's the idea of the larger um, uh, the larger effort. This particular piece of work is an attempt to actually classify endpoint types, and the idea behind it is that if you could if you could classify endpoint types then you might actually be able to give guidance and if you could um, uh, maybe specify the security characteristics of particular endpoint types you might be able to uh, give guidance to protocol designers about what consideration should be given uh, for uh, adapting protocols for those particular endpoint types now the idea behind this is that um, the, the the intuitive idea is that the endpoint um, environment has changed since 2003. And so what we see in RFC 3552 has probably changed. And if that's true, and we could classify the endpoints, um, what I wondered in, before I wrote this draft, and as I was writing this draft, is could we go ahead and 
um, classify those endpoints? And if we were able to classify them, could we talk about their uh, security characteristics, right? So next slide. So the, uh, um, my metric for whether or not this kind of work would be useful is that if you could actually do a classification of endpoint types, and then you could talk about uh, um, in some granularity what the security characteristics of those endpoint types would be, then maybe what you could do are these two things here. Some research could be done uh, on those security characteristics and influence protocol design, that's number one. And number two, you know, if that were true, uh, it might be something that helped, helped us in Model T reconsider the landscape that's documented in um, 3552. Uh, so next slide. Perfect. So um, the first draft of this document, which I, I did not bring to Model T, I, I brought it to the work that was going on um, uh, in SMART and in CLESS, the first document was entirely flat in that it was a taxonomy that divided endpoint types into um, eight different classes and then attempted to describe those classes. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, one of the suggestions we got is um, to go ahead and provide a hierarchy so that the endpoint classes were a little bit deeper than um, um, a very high level uh, characteristic. The current draft doesn't do that. Um, I took that as advice, but I think that there's some danger in doing um, a highly granular taxonomy here. What we're trying to do instead is to provide an upper level characteristics sort of um, uh, delineation so that protocol designers can understand security characteristics of, of larger groups of endpoint devices, right? And so I, I took the advice that um, um, a hierarchy might be useful, but I didn't act upon it. Uh, so that's one of the changes that's in the current draft. Um, next slide. For each one of the groupings, um, there's a description of what the endpoint grouping is like and um, a description of its, um, a, and fundamentally a description of that class of endpoints. And then for each class, uh, there are seven things that are described for that class. So what we think of as commonalities per, for each class of endpoint device. And you can see them on the screen here. I, I won't read them, but they're things that are, um, I think, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, and so what happens in this environment is that for each, one of the, for each one of the particular classes, you get a description of the class, and then these features, these characteristics of each one of those classes. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so the goal of the draft is purely, purely informative. There's no normative uh, language in it at all. <clears throat> and, um, and the reason I brought it to Model T was because I, th I do think it's informative to Model T. I think part of our work in reconsidering um, uh, 3552 is re reconsidering the threat landscape. And part of reconsidering the threat landscape is um, reconsidering sort of the, the endpoint architecture that we currently support, uh, both on public and private internets. So it's informative. <clears throat> There's no real intent here to, um, to provide any normative text at all. Um, and one of the goals is to try to show that such a taxonomy is possible. That's, that's one, of, one of the goals, because if it is, I think it's my intuition anyway, that um, that would show that the description of the threat landscape that's currently in RFC 3552 certainly needs to be updated. And that's a conversation that is just one part of what's going on with Model T. So maybe I'll take you to the next slide. So the future for the draft, <clears throat> I bring it here just to, um, uh, first of all, to get more comments on it. And then second of all, to inform the conversation that we're having here in Model T about what to do next here about describing uh, the threat landscape. Uh, this is just one small part of it, uh, a part that I'm interested in, but it is one small part of it because we're talking about endpoints here entirely. Um, I do, I will go back and reconsider the idea of doing a hierarchy instead of a taxonomy, although I'm, I'm reluctant, uh, reluctant to go down that path. And then of course, um, further discussion inside of Model T, whether or not 
this is actually useful for the discussion. Um, uh, one of the goals here is not re not related to T at all, but to combine this work with other work that's going on in class. And I promised I would be short, but my next slide is uh, how I get out of here. So there's the um, there's the draft. Uh, my email address. I'm uh, thrilled to take questions and comments, and I'll uh, I'll just wait for that. Thanks. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, so again, if you want to jump in the mic line, then just put in a plus Q in the WebEx chat, uh, and we have Karsten at, at the head of the line. Thank you. So skimming through this draft, I noticed that the classes you have in this taxonomy actually describe the role that endpoints play, the interactions they have with their digital and their physical or human environment. And you seem to infer the characteristics of the endpoints from the characteristics, characteristics that an endpoint for one of these roles should have. And um, actually, <clears throat> I've been trying to work on something similar but different, which is uh, revisiting RFC 7228, where we try to come up with some of those actual characteristics of the devices themselves. So I'm not, not saying that these two pieces of work uh, need to relate to each other, but I, I see two approaches that may be somewhat complementary. Uh, so thanks, Karsten. And I'm. Um... I'd be very happy to talk offline about whether it's possible to combine the work. I, I actually would kind of welcome that. Um, one of the things that you, you said first was that um, part, of, part of my descriptions of the classes is to talk about the roles of the endpoints. And I wrestled with that, to be honest, because I think that the, um, that the, the classes should be as generic as possible. And that anything where you describe roles should just be as examples. They shouldn't um, help define the classes, if that makes any sense. So I appreciate that comment. And um, and uh, a to do for me is just to talk to you offline about uh, whether or not we can uh, combine this work with 7228. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dominique. I think you're next in the queue. And I don't know, I have added you to the queue if, uh, after Yari. So, Dominique. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hey, Mark, thanks a lot for the presentation and the draft, which I've read um, a couple of times. Just a quick question you have um, another draft, uh, Smart Threat Changes, um, a problem statement. I was just wondering how that fit into this work and um, sort of how you see the two going together. Thanks. Yeah, I, I do have a um, another draft that is talking about the threat landscape. It's it's sort of um, a response to Yari and, and Stephen's uh, draft. Um, and when uh, we had our last virtual interim meeting, um, when the Vancouver meeting was canceled, it was for me a, an opportunity to sort of think about people who said, "Look, the threat landscape hasn't changed that much." Um, in the time since uh, 3552 was written and uh, it only needs minor tweaks. And I kind of thought about that and thought, gee, that, that doesn't seem right to me, that it seems like there have been major changes to both the um, architecture and the endpoints that are supported uh, in the public internet. So that draft is a response in many ways to some of the discussions. The idea behind it is really for it to be a part of the conversation going forward in Model T it really is orthogonal to the endpoints draft. Okay, great, thanks. We can probably talk about it a bit more later after okay. all the drafts. Cool, thanks. And then I have Yari, then Arno, then Christian, and then Watson. So Yari? Yeah, so thank you, Mark. This is uh, quite interesting. Um, I, I, often think about things from the point of view, like how can I use this information? And I, I have a question about that uh, in the case of your categories also, like uh, the phone that's on my table is probably all of the categories that you listed in the, in the draft. Um, and, you know, how, how am I to, as a protocol designer going to take into account the different roles or for the categories and, and uh, one 
possible answer perhaps is that you're going to focus on like this application endpoint that we're going to make it very clear that, that the application endpoint is sort of standing on its own and it has nothing to do with the other stuff on my phone for instance and that that's the sort of the, the thinking that becomes clear for us and, and therefore we can, we can easy, easier design things is that what you were thinking of or or something else Part of that, uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, part of that is true. Uh, one of one of my thoughts when <clears throat> um, I was looking at devices endpoints that sort of wash over multiple categories, if you will, would be would be um, easily understood to be in multiple categories. Is that if the work is useful, one of the things we're doing here is identifying the security characteristics of each particular class, and if I had high hopes uh, and was extremely optimistic, part of what would go on here is you would describe the security characteristics of each class in such a way that it helped protocol designers address security considerations for that class of devices. For a device that actually could be in multiple classes like your phone on, on the table, then what we would be giving protocol designers is not just one set of security considerations, but multiple things to take into account as they design uh, protocols and so that's what I that's what I had in back of my mind and, and how those thoughts link up certainly your your remark about the application endpoints is exactly right and I, I don't disagree with that but to answer your first sort of question I would say that one of my goals here if I had if I was very optimistic was to provide security considerations that protocol could designers could um, put together if they were uh, targeting devices that fit in multiple categories. I wonder if that's clear. That makes sense, thank you. Great, thanks uh, Arno, I think you're next. Yes, can you hear me? Perfectly, thank you. Yeah, okay, hi Steve. Uh, yes, so it's more of a comment here. Um, so unfortunately, I had a difficult life since Montreal, so I could only uh, restart to work on class uh, recently. Uh, but in fact, the, the origin of Mark's job is when class started and we started to list uh, and organize the uh, limitations and capabilities of endpoint security solutions, uh, we started to realize that uh, we were completely missing a proper model of endpoints. So, what I realized when I did this section in class, I, I, I had to really limit myself to the minimum. But it was, it is a problem because later in class itself, not what Mark has done now, but in class itself, the problem is that there is no uniformity to describe the type of attack. So in fact, it's not only that we are missing a, a model for endpoints with which, uh, which Mark has started, but we are missing a model on threats, on attacks themselves. So the idea is that when we started that with Mark, in fact, Mark approached me at that time saying, Arno, what if we would organize a categorization of endpoint so that then it would make my life much easier and much better, more powerful and more clear in class itself. And the, in fact, I started to experiment a little bit in the version two, because I was missing time, uh, how to join the dots between class and what Mark has done. And, and we had a call last, no, 10 days ago, because I was in early days last week um, at home, of course. And we started to see that uh, we could see how I could systematically inform Mark about what is the gap towards my document. So let's say if we have done a good job, what Mark has done, I should. I should eliminate some text and make it much more uniform in class itself. That's one part. What we'd be then missing is the is the is the attack landscape document that we was supposed to be started by another person, but it started to be slow. So the idea is class itself would be the joint between a uh, marked document and other document to be defined, so that we we we, we make class lighter and clearer, so that. It's and more uniform. So, so perhaps we can start to find new abstraction uh, layers. We can find perhaps a way to describe uh, in a more uniform manner 
the, the characteristics of the endpoints, whether they are on the left side or right side of the communication. Uh, so we, I think we, we believe with Mark there is a very good potential for uh, this situation in this way, so that we can then uh, be more equipped with, um, with perhaps better descriptors for the future, for example, for what you guys are trying to do with Model T. I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, I don't know if Mark has a response to that, but if, if yeah, go ahead. Uh, that was that seemed more like commentary on the future of class here. So I'll just let that stand. Okay, uh, and we have Watson, and as the end of the queue for now. So I just have a quick question about sort of terminological clarification. I'm hearing a lot of discussion about threat landscape, but that seems different from a threat model. A threat model is about what can an attacker do. And it seems that if we're going to talk about a threat landscape, that's that's what attackers like to do. And so I think there's a there there might be a gap here between sort of imagining how we talk about the threats and what we actually need to design protocols or bust to threats that we haven't necessarily thought about. I mean, if you look at RFC at the RFC we're, we're thinking about replacing, that's what it does. It's it's entirely about everything that can be done. I think that's a really helpful remark. I, um, I, I think being careful uh, to distinguish those two is essential, not just for a draft like this, but for all of our conversations in Model T. So I, I really appreciate that that remark. I, I think that's really helpful. And in the unhelpful way, I was uh, I actually skipped Christian, who was in the queue before Watson. So apologies, Christian, and uh, you're up now. I, I, I have reservation about classifications because uh, pretty much every classification exercise ends up uh, finding that we have a continuum and, uh, and basically you end up picking points in the continuum and I'm, I'm not too sure that this is uh, overly productive and specifically uh, there's always temptation because it is a continuum to go to uh, a very large number of points and then it becomes non-usable. Uh, more interestingly for me is that there are a couple of big questions like uh, on the device which is effectively can the software be updated and by whom and who can install software on the device and, and basically the these are more about the management of the device and about the size of the software. But I think that the, the management is uh, kind of as important as whether your, soft, your device has a 6400, uh, 640K of memory or 64 megabytes. It's uh, in my mind more important, especially for the threat model. Uh, we, we have seen threat model with new device that are um, Based on the fact that there is no clear definition of who manages them, for example, importing devices in your home network that uh, end up being a surveillance point for a surveillance operation, or uh, having devices in an enterprise network that end up being uh, uh, like this classic problem of the uh, uh, casino in Vegas being attacked because someone was able to attack uh, the uh, management device that was managing the aquariums in the lounges. So I, I am more interested in this business of management and uh, scope of control than the actual uh, complete topology of devices. And I think that topology is a bit, bit of a, a never ending effort. Uh, thanks, Christian. Um, so it seems to me there were two threads there to your thought. The first, the early thread was the thought that uh, any categorization faces the problem that this is really a continuum of devices and capabilities. Um, yes, I, I agree with that, right? Um, what I was attempting to do 
was uh, not deny that there's a continuum, but instead to put possibly arbitrary uh, groupings. Um, 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 it, you uh, imagine um, if you imagine a continuum. What I'm trying to do here is to provide kind of arbitrary slices of that continuum and give them uh, descriptions and provide characteristics. So while I recognize that um, it is a continuum, and I, I was not hopeless about the fact that you could possibly divide the continuum up into uh, distinct segments. Um, that much said, the second stream of what you said that you, you were very interested in the management of classes of devices rings really true to me. And I think that that would really improve a subsequent draft is that for each classification, I'm recognizing that you're skeptical that we'll ever get the classifications right. But if I were optimistic and I said that in a future draft for each one of these classifications, as part of the description of the characteristics of those classes, we also described their managed, how the devices were managed and what their management capabilities were. Um, uh, I think that that's a, a very useful suggestion, and I will definitely take that on. Okay, Mark, so uh, I don't know, Christian, you want to come back or? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so we don't actually have anybody in the queue unless I've forgotten somebody else, in which case my apologies in advance. Uh, I, meanwhile, in case people want to join the queue, Mark, did you have any kind of, when is a good time for people to read this draft and send comments to the list? Is it you know, on the current one or wait for another revision or roughly when about might that happen, do you think? Well, so um, let me answer, answer your question in a slightly ob obtuse way here. Um, from the discussion here, I took that I've got um, sort of two to-dos and our note taker has something concrete to work with. One of them is I will work with Karsten offline to see whether or not this work could fit together with 7228. I think that was a really good suggestion. Um, and then from Yari, um, Watson, and, and Christian, I got really good suggestions for how the draft could be improved. And I would say that what I will try to do is get a new draft of, of this document uh, out sometime in May, uh, perhaps by the middle of May. And then I'd appreciate, and I will you know, put it on the uh, Model T mailing list and then um, look forward to further comments. How does that sound? That sounds great. And hopefully by the middle of May, maybe we'll all be more free than we are now. So we'll be much, we'll get nicer comments even. <laughs> all right, thanks. Okay, so uh, again, nobody else seems to have joined the queue. I'm guessing we may be okay to move on to the next agenda item. Um, and Dominique, that's you. You have two drafts. Uh, I, I didn't put them in any particular order. If you want to take them as as one thing or two things, that's entirely whatever you're happy with. So, I think um, I'm going to take them as two things because one sort of alludes to the other. So, um, so thanks for having the call and um, great to see quite a few people on the call. And I'm going to talk about my two drafts. Um, the first one uh, is an update to an older draft and I renamed it. So it's called a user-focused internet threat model. I don't have slides because I thought I would completely um, try to keep it simple. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, so the first draft um, that I'm talking about is basically an update uh, and it is user-focused and it looks at sort of, it's the reason behind, um, you know, reconsidering um, threat modeling and reconsidering sort of an update to um, RFC 3552. Um, it's user focused and in this update, it also takes on a couple of new, um, I put in a new data breaches, but if you read through it, you'll also see that there's still a bit of work to be done and I wanna put an attack model into it and various other things like that. Um, it also points out some other endpoint vulnerabilities, but again, it's not a massive update to the last one um, that I presented uh, uh, last year, actually. Um, so, in, under point six in that um, in that draft, uh, there's a TBD about protocol designs, and um, instead of kind of filling that out, I decided to uh, put in a new draft, which is the next one that we're talking about, um, let me just pull it up, which is a security considerations for protocol designers. 
Um, this is a much longer draft and it's also a first draft. So there's still a lot of um, a lot of sort of things that need to be filled out. However, the point of this one in particular um, looks at considerations for protocol designers, focuses on attack defense. It classifies the types of attacks in the first part. And it looks at defensive measures, measures and security considerations in the second part. Um, I try to also fill it out in terms of case studies and examples, which I do need um, a lot more help in and, and I do need to fill out a bit more. But basically, um, just to kind of highlight it a little bit, section two talks about the attacks. And again, I'll go through a number of um, uh, different uh, case studies that we probably all are quite familiar with. And section three looks at defensive measures. Um, and again, I look at quite a lot of um, uh, case studies that we've already seen. And I think under the defensive measures, there's still quite a few more that I'd like to um, to add as well. And uh, and also, you know, based on what we've experienced um, in the last couple of weeks, in the last couple of months with the cur current pandemic going on, I think there's some really interesting case studies that can be added as well. Um, so that's basically the overview. Um, and I hopefully some of you or a few of you have read it, but basically I'm just looking for feedback at this point on the on the first one, which again is a sort of second draft, very minimal. And then on the second one, which is this particular draft um, and sort of ways forward and how this fits into to the work. And I have some ideas, but I, I would really appreciate a lot of um, a lot of feedback at the moment, and I'm looking to update these two for um, for July, which I think will probably be virtual, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, so yeah, so that's it. Very brief, and um, yeah, I look forward to discussing this. Thanks, Dominique. Uh, if you want me to scroll to some particular part of a draft at any point in the Q and A type thing, then just say so. And right. in the queue, we have Watson and Yari. So Watson. Thank you very much for writing a draft. I think it really highlights where you want to go with this. Uh, I, I'm just looking at the protocol design one. It seems to be talked like a lot of these threats are ones where, like take for instance, say uh, SQL injection, right? This can be mitigated through software improvements, it's not a protocol issue per se. And then we're talking about say hijacking traffic with DGP hijacking and DNS problems. I mean, this is a consequence of the security model of BGP, but that's already identifiable as a problem if you look at the existing threat model and consider how BGP you know, fails to authenticate the data that's being sent in. So, you know, looking at this, I'm just not really, it's not clear to me which of these threats require changes to the threat model. For protocol designers to look at or what those changes would be. I, I think you have specific problems, but if protocol designers can't mitigate them or can't, you know, can't change a protocol to be able to, to solve them, then that raises questions of what the update has to look like to enable that. Cool. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for that. And I, I actually totally agree. What I was trying to do here, at least on the First draft is that um, I was basically throwing everything in, you know, uh, to highlight the fact that these ta attacks do exist. And I totally take your point because not all of them are specifically related to protocols. But I do think that at least on the initial first pass, um, you know, some of the threats we could be aware of them, right? Um, especially if it's sort of unintentionally the protocols are sort of contributing to it. Um, so, so I think that's actually really good feedback for me because, again, I was trying to capture just everything and and try to see if I can just sort of come up with a list, not necessarily a taxonomy, but come up with like a, K, a list of case studies for that. So I'll try to be more specific about um, effectively about the the you know what are what are directly impact protocols and directly impact protocol design versus things that are probably perhaps more unintended consequences or have unintended results. So thank you for that. Okay, so I have Yari and Wendy and then Eric. So Yari. Uh, thank you for this, Dominique. I think there's a really good list of uh, attacks and good list of things to, to um, 
that, that we need to deal with uh, in order to uh, prevent some of these attacks. Um, maybe a depressingly long list of both of them. Um, not sure it's entirely complete though. So <clears throat> for instance, I, I think you're kind of missing some of the insider attacks on the second draft uh, and structural problems like telling a participant more than, than you should. You do have insider threats, but it's more like in the social engineering type of sense than, than like a protocol node sense that I, I, I told this node too much and then the node was misbehaving uh, for uh, one reason or, or the other. Not this is just compromise, but just because it's uh, incentives or, or it's uh, interest were different than, than mine. So maybe that's a thing that you could perhaps add. And also I think the, the list of remedies is more in the type of uh, what can we do in the network than, than uh, what can we do in the protocol design phase. And I, I think uh, we could add, add a few things in the, the latter category as well. But otherwise I like this. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Did both. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and next up is Wendy, then Eric, then Christian, who I won't forget this time. So Wendy. Uh, yes, th 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 thank you for for, for this draft. I'm, I'm looking at the the security considerations um, for for protocol designers. Uh, Wendy Seltzer uh, here, and um, I, th I think what what strikes me is sort of uh, it's a very good list for users of uh, protocols and designers of systems that build on sort of the layered stack uh, to be thinking of all of the ways that uh, technology uh, can be abused and subverted uh, and used against them. Um, I, I, I wonder, it, some of them look less amenable to being addressed in the protocol design uh, and yeah, in, in, on a layered thinking uh, of of protocol design, you might even say uh, some of them shouldn't be addressed in the uh, in the design of a protocol that's seen as low level, uh, but rather on uh, applications uh, above that. And and so uh, I wonder uh, as as the focus um, shifts toward you know, uh, responses or the what should people do once they've taken these things into consideration, uh, whether you end up saying uh, some of these are to be noted and then uh, simply noted to uh, higher levels or other uh, users and implementers in the stack. Let's see. Yeah, that's that's actually a really, really good point. So the it, the first pass of this was just like breaking it down into two sections. I could actually almost from your comments see breaking it down into further sections based on the the it, yeah on the different layers. And it's actually really, I think that's really helpful. I can probably even do that in my next pass. So thank you for that. That's really, really useful. Okay, so we have Eric and then Arno. So Eric. It's not audible. Am I, oh. Am I audible now? Maybe not. Yes. Yes, I hear you now. I am good. Okay. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> 3552 was intended to serve two purposes, right? Um, one to, um, I guess, three. Um, one to have some tutorial material on how to think about threat modeling. One about um, and about protocols one to um you know try to set a baseline kind of like expectation about what protocols should be like do and third to describe um you know how to uh, um uh, how to write the security consideration section which is what the document's actually nominally about um so I mean, I guess and one of the things we've already started from doing that was to actually write these example um security considerations um and um, you know, see how with the instructions we were giving people actually deliver the security considerations sessions we were hoping that they would have. Um, so I, I guess my question here is, um, if one were to take these documents on board, um, how would this affect the security considerations or the design of protocols which you've already built? Okay, so, um, so first of all, I think that uh, 
basically, I think all of the documents, including yours, that or well, not yours, but Yari's, that's Yari and Stevens, that's supposed to that's coming up, right? That have different approaches. Um, all of them should be included in the sense that, like, they they highlight different aspects, right? So I think regardless of whether or not the protocol has already been built or is going forward, my my feeling for the particular draft that I came up with is that it's just awareness raising issue on, you know, on awareness raising sort of thing on some of the issues. And as Wendy rightly pointed out, there are different issues depending on different layers, right? So I think that depending on, well, I think that going forward, all of this fits into one thing, right? Because because they're different, because Yari and Steven actually basically highlight different approaches, right? And highlight different risks and highlight different threat models, which I totally think is actually completely useful in a different way than the sort of endpoint threat models and the and the different sort of aspects that I have in my draft. So maybe maybe I'm too much thinking of it being as a broad church where everything needs to be addressed and looked at before we kind of think about updating it, but um, or how we're going to update it in the process. But that's sort of what I'm thinking. Uh, I think I'm asking a different question, um, which is um, like. The, the purpose of producing these documents is to give guidance to, or any document of this kind, is to give guidance to the people writing the RFCs, which we then input, then describe the protocols, which then implement. And so my question is, if what is what would in what way would this document? I'm trying to understand what the impact of this document is, and so I'm trying to understand how if we take some example documents, which we've which have involved protocols we designed, how would how would being how would the material in this document alter the protocols and or the security considerations in those documents? Okay. So I think that the the bottom line is that this is more up to date. I'm not even sure it will impact previous protocols, but I think it, it's more about going forward. I mean, don't you agree on that? Well, I, I guess maybe, but I'm trying to. I guess what I'm trying to understand. And so we could certainly take some protocols which are currently being developed. But I guess what I'm trying to understand is. But I mean, like we have like plenty of protocols that were published like in the past two years, right? And so, and so my question is like, I guess you know, like, like so, as a, like, how would you change? How would you want to change security considerations for Quick based on the material in this document and or TLS one three or DOE? And so, like, I'm trying to understand that because I'm trying to understand whether I think that whether what what they think that there would be good, good changes or not. Right. I'm not even, I mean, I'm not even sure that there are going to be m many changes to that, right? I mean, unless there are like massive updates to like Quick or Doe or anything like that, because they're in a, I mean, that's what I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think about going forward from now, right? I don't know. Do we want to talk about this offline and maybe take specific well, Sure. Examples? Yeah, I guess okay. I'm just trying to understand. That's cool. like, no, that would be good. Okay. Yeah. I guess I'm just trying to understand. I, th I think this is like a good test for all these documents, right? Is like, yeah, yeah. Is like what would, what would materially change about the work we do Based on the material in this document, because if the answer is nothing, then pro then I don't really understand what we're doing. Well, yeah, but we don't know what protocols are going to be developed in like five to ten years, right? Like, uh, <laughs> I, I, guess, mean, I, I think if you can't, I, th I think if we can't retrospectively go at, go back and ask how we wish these documents were different, then we're like really, then it's like really hard to understand what the, what what this exercise is doing. So, okay, cool. Okay, cool. All right. I think we should have a. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, I think I have Arno, uh, Christian, sorry, I have, and then Arno. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, I, uh, I I really like this idea of doing a list of attacks. I mean, I, I do understand uh, what Eric is saying, that it's not directly actionable in terms of protocol design, but uh, nevertheless, that's quite interesting. However, when I read your um, your draft, uh, there are two additional things that I would like to see in drafts like that. The first one is what were the assets that the attacker were looking after? And, and the reason for looking at the assets is that the, the basic threat modeling starts with what is it that you want to protect exactly? And it's often very, very fuzzy. But if we have a clear view of what attackers are after, then uh, it becomes easier to say, OK, the weakness in this protocol may drive 
and attack against these or that kind of assets. To give examples, uh, uh, we have seen attacks in the past that uh, were looking at, uh, for example, getting a, getting a foothold in a protected network, uh, which were basically typically uh, trying to do uh, phishing attacks and things like that. But the idea that you get something running inside the protected network and use that as a basis for personal attack is something that we have to consider. The other kind of uh, asset that we have seen are attacks on metadata. Uh, several of the attacks in the past have been attacks trying to get listing about uh, user IDs, listing about uh, what people are doing, uh, um, access to databases, but they could be also access about what is the activity going on on a particular network. And so, uh, I'd like in your um, description to see basically to get examples of those targeted attacks against specific assets. And finally, uh, we have uh, attacks about uh, databases, about threat secrets and things like that. And we have also well-publicized attacks against uh, basically just uh, in order to drive extortion against the continuous operation of the business. Extortion attacks using either uh, denial of service attacks or uh, ransomware, which are kind of going to the same goal, but with different means. So, I mean, I, I, I'd like to see if you, if you pursue that um, effort, you should really look at what kind of assets the attackers were after. And that would inform things about uh, what I am going at next, which is the schema of those attacks. And what's, what's very clear about all of those attacks is there's a cascading effect. Uh, typically, the attackers in most of those attacks don't attack one system in isolation. Mm -hmm. they are, or one endpoint in isolation. They attack typically a system, a network, an enterprise, a school, something like that. And, and they go through a process of getting a foothold and then getting to data and things like that. So that gives us also the idea of uh, basically one of the problem we have with our deployments is that we don't have defense in depth. And, uh, and that will be, in my mind, the uh, to, answer Eric's question, showing how the absence of defense in depth leads to catastrophic effects would be very interesting because uh, defense in depth, it's something that we can incorporate in protocol design at some level. So that these are the, the two things that uh, I'd like to see in, in this kind of evolution of the draft. One, looking at the assets that people could think about the other one uh, looking at defense in depth uh, or lack thereof and what its effects are. Great. Thank you. So asset protection and defense in depth. And I think that could be accomplished by filling out some of the sections that are that are already there on data protection, but going a little more specifically on sort of what kind of data and and sort of the characteristics of um, of how that how that was breached. So thank you. That's really, really helpful. Yeah, and, and by assets, I, I, it's not necessarily just that people are looking after the database of credit cards. It's a, a look at, for example, this attack on this casino in Las Vegas that started by hacking uh, the uh, climate control system of the aquarium. Yep. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, and and th th that's illuminating because it, it tells you how a, a very benign system, like I mean, who cares about the temperature control in an aquarium? I mean, yeah, you might lose some fishes, but what, 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 what is the airport? And, and in fact, what that gives you is a foothold in someone's uh, data network that can then be used to go further. So, I mean, we have to publicize these kind of things. Yeah, great, great idea. Thank you. Uh, so there's also, I think, some backing to, in the in the WebEx chat about uh, 
thinking about us for thinking about assets. Uh, and I think we have Arno in the queue uh, next. Uh, yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, so, in fact, I would like to continue from what uh, Christian has said. Um, so, so in fact, the, the issue of the asset is that the asset is is very relative value. Um, it really depends. So for example, right now, my phone has no interest for a hacker, uh, but a, a, a phone that would be used by some other person in some other context would be very valuable for the attacker. Um, the and, and this leads back to the risk management because this is a risk management uh, issue and this is defined already elsewhere in ISO and in, I, in IEC and, and in other places. Um, so it, it's it's true, but at the same time, it's going to be very difficult to to describe that in this draft from my perspective. Uh, the point of the campaign uh, is very good. I, I think the campaign, and this is why we, we need to have. Uh, uh, a, a way to describe atomic attacks, and that's perhaps part of the model versus the landscape, I think what's on. Uh, campaign is actually an orchestration of the attack in a certain way, and the defense is an orchestration of the defense to fight a certain campaign. And we, we do not, the problem is that we do not have the Lego bricks of language to actually describe that. So. Now, when I look at this draft, for example, uh, Dominic, uh, phishing, for me, phishing is not an attack on, on, on a device. It's an attack on the brain, right? But you have other places where you have an attack on the device, and this links back to what Mark is trying to do, what I'm trying to do. So the issue we have now coming back to the problem of how it, and what Eric said about how it speaks to the protocol designers. We do not have the mapping between these type of documents or what I do or what Mark is doing versus what is important for the for the the, the protocol designer. We are missing some language here. And the language what I would like to have with Mark is a language that goes beyond the category to describe the attack surface problem. What is the attack surface? That's that's the attack surface that is coming from the asset, from what Christian has said. The problem then is we do not see the view. We, we, we need to distinguish the two things from the asset side versus the attack side. We really need to make this explicit distinction and reorganize the language on both sides to understand, OK, now we have a, a language to describe our vulnerabilities in terms of, yes, you can, you can call it management, you can call it the, the way that the, the physical system is organized, blah, 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 on one side. And then you have the attack on the other side. And then you have the mitigation that is trying to answer the attack that is trying to, to attack the attack surface. And we are just missing this language, first of all, to, to organize that better. So, so I think this is a gap that we have between at least uh, the few drafts that, that we have seen so far. Stop here. Thanks. Yeah, no, I completely understand what you're getting at with that. So I've made a note. Lots of great feedback overall. So thank you, Arno. We can talk about it a bit more too. <laughs> we can. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I don't have anybody else in the queue at the moment. Uh, one little bit of housekeeping. We have a call-in user. Uh, if you could identify yourself, that would be just for the notes, that'd be great. Uh, it may be somebody who's in twice or something, but there's a call-in user five. If you could let us know who you are, that'd be cool. And while that call and users are muting or trying to. Uh, okay, that was that was Eric. Okay. Uh, so Dominic, I guess I think you kind of answered this at the beginning, um, but uh, you, so your kind of plan is to maybe do a revision of this in a, in a month or two, and uh, you looking for more feedback on the current version in between now and then. Is that roughly correct or? Yes, yeah, and just to highlight, I got feedback from Watson, Wendy, EKR, Christian, and Arno, and also Randy and Mark in the chat as well, building a little bit more on Christian. So I will um, incorporate those comments and I'll probably reach out to all of you um, on that. Um, and also, you know, I'm happy and open to any collaboration if there's any sections or any particular um, individual parts that people want to, to work on or add to, please let you know, please feel free. I'd be happy, more than happy for that. So, yeah, thanks. Great, thanks. And 
Okay, so I think we're on to Yari, and I'll swap over the slidey thing. I think this will be relatively brief. So this is an update on the on the draft that uh, me and Stephen wrote. And, uh, the slides were sent on the list. Uh, if you, Stephen, go to the second slide, that's the only content slide. So as you may remember, this draft essentially talks about like why do we need to go beyond Consec and uh, it's about the details of that. And two things happened in the previous round of updates, draft updates. So first of all, we added material on web tracking, uh, thanks to Eric and Chris who submitted uh, text. That's great. Um, so this is under section 2.3, which is examples, and then section four uh, areas requiring further study. I mean, we clearly know some things about uh, web tracking, but maybe it's not an entirely exhausted topic yet. So that's one thing. Uh, feedback on the specifics of the text is always welcome, of course. And uh, the other thing that, that we sort of reformulated in the draft was we started thinking about exactly what do we want to do for RFC 3552. And we basically offered three alternatives. And, and just for background, and this sort of ties into the previous discussion that we had with Eric and you all about like what you know, what's the output of this. This exercise are we changing 3552 and you know is there like one document or some small update or four documents whatever um so my personal view at least that there's some sort of supporting documentation like stevens and my, my draft is one example of that but other other drafts as well and they could be published on their own and uh, I at least would have some interest in doing that, that for our draft. But in addition to that, there is this you know, question of whether we should add you know, a little bit to the, the existing RFC and exactly what is that little bit. And we basically came up with three choices here. Like one is this essentially one sentence. It's simple but obvious. Um, it's easy to add, but you know, do we want to update the entire RFC for that one sentence? Uh, we could talk uh, for the option two slightly more about the capabilities required for the attack to happen, for attacks to happen, and some analysis like what you need to do in order to defend against this. Uh, but you know, so like two, two, two more paragraphs, or we could provide a more comprehensive set of defense guidelines. Uh, you know, still at the relatively high level, but this is like. A new subsection in the document. And this again, by the way, text that was contributed by Eric and Chris. So thank you very much again. Um, so here we would talk about things like how to limit time of exposure, of, you know, making backers uh, have to use active attacks and so forth. Um, and this could be one new subsection. It's not like a super comprehensive thing either. Like it could still fit in the document, I think nicely. But it could also be a freestanding RFC and perhaps go into more, more depth. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not particularly wedded to any of these options here. Um, looking for feedback from you guys. And uh, that's more of what I said. Stephen, do you want to add something? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I haven't actually looked at this for a while, so I, no. Uh, and, and also, I'm trying to keep be less opinionated tonight this evening, so I'm, I'm just be chair like. So you're doing fine. <laughs> All right. So let's open it up for questions or comments. So okay. So we don't have anybody in the queue right now. Wendy has offered to send some mail with some help, um, and a couple of people have had to leave at the top of the hour. So uh, Watson. Uh, so I looked over a draft that I, I think it's pretty good. Um, one thing I'd like to add is there, there's discussion about sort of control. There's some discussion about sort of control plane things, but there isn't a lot about the way in which, say, you have a Kubernetes cluster, all your network access and, and policies, et cetera, are really kind of useless because everything goes over port 8 or port 443. And so you have a layer of authorization and authentication concerns, which are sort of above the HTTP layer. And 
And so it's very easy to make mistakes where you have, say, proxy and all of a sudden everything is completely terrible. And that's, that's a threat that hasn't been considered before and I think should be added. Okay, that sounds interesting and, and quite valid thing. Uh, I guess I at least had my protocol engineer head on when I was thinking about this topic earlier, but, but you raise a valid point, so we can talk about that too. Thank you. Uh, Christian? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's a very concrete draft that uh, you two have been preparing, but I'm really working worrying that we are missing the, the overarching uh, surveillance is an attack draft. I mean, uh, a, a lot of the practical attacks on, uh, I mean, Dominic has been looking at the, the big attacks, the one that go uh, against the, the breaches and the uh, advanced uh, threats and things like that. But there is this permanent low level threat of uh, surveying people and surveillance and and using say uh, either the advertisement model in the web or uh, various devices uh, uh, buying a thermostat and having it survey uh, the inhabitant of the house and things like that and and i don't know whether we should have an effort there similar to uh, the um as if monitoring is an attack effort. Yeah, I, I'm kind of wondering, like, how do we, I mean, did we miss that? Or, I mean, did you, I, I think we talk about that, but maybe it's not as prominent and it's not in blinking red letters, but we can think about making it better. Maybe that's a thing for you and I to discuss as one figure out. You know, I mean, I, I, I'd, be happy, I, I'd be happy to discuss that, but basically we, we have to raise this, uh, hey, you have to defend something against surveillance, the same level as you have to defend against monitoring. And, and the, the way to do that is to make that prominent. Okay. Okay, so Ted. Thanks. I, uh, I, I guess the short thing is if, if you and Christian are going to chat about this, I'd, I'd be interested in being part of the chat as well. But I think the longer thing is I've, I've become increasingly convinced that we actually have more than one category here that we've, we've been lumping into surveillance and that the defenses against the different categories are substantially different. And as a result of that, we, we may want to actually make clear that the way we were thinking about pervasive surveillance or the way we're thinking about the defenses against pervasive surveillance uh, probably don't actually map all that well into the advertising model concerns that Christian is uh, chatting about. So I think we, we may actually want to see if there's some way of breaking apart that, um, that category in ways that would make building the defenses a little bit more obvious. I think that's a really good suggestion, actually. And uh, maybe Mark could expand his draft to categorize all these different surveillance devices and applications that we have. But um, yeah, um, more seriously, I, I think this, this is a thing that we should actually do. Thank you, Ted. OK. Uh, I I agree that that I think that's a good point as well. Ted is not. Uh, so I don't have anybody else in the queue unless I'm messing up again, which is quite possible. Um, if not, uh, I guess Yari, when do you plan to update the draft? Um, so I, I, I guess in you know, the the new feedback that we just received, notwithstanding, I was before that I was feeling like we're pretty ready. I, I think the new new information needs to go in, but we can probably do that uh, by early early May. Um, and then my plan was that I would like to sort of shift mode a little bit, like instead of add more stuff to the draft, uh, start 
start ready to something that's sort of well scoped and uh, publishable. Maybe cut some pieces away from it and put it elsewhere, like separate the 3552 updates and, and uh, the rationale and so on. But in May, basically, that, that's when I, I want to do something. Um, kind of works for me as well, so that's good. Uh, okay, so I think we have nobody else in the queue. We've talked about drafts. The only other agenda is, uh, I guess it might be worth spending just a couple of minutes on how would people like to proceed, given we're probably not going to Madrid. Um, so I, I guess the obvious thing is to kind of have these kind of uh, calls at some frequency, uh, but what what are people's thoughts? What would you like? And Mark? Oh, thanks. I, I, um, so I, I agree too. I'm I'm pretty skeptical that we'll meet physically in Madrid, although um, there should be no counting on my crystal ball in any way. Uh, on the other hand, I'd like to see progress keep going there. And when I heard Yari sort of talk about getting a draft done in May, um, uh, early May, mid-May, um, I would be committed to uh, uh, revising my my work by that time. I think it would be great uh, if the chairs scheduled another a virtual session like this, trying to keep it to an hour again. I, I know that's hard, um, but uh, try to do that sometime in mid to late May. That'd be my suggestion. Um, okay, so that gets a plus one, and nobody disagreeing. So yeah, uh, and and is there any particular cadence uh, after that? Just, let's imagine between now and November-ish. Um, monthly is a suggestion from Randy. Uh, any other suggestions, or should we try and schedule monthly? Okay, so uh, uh, Stephen, can I can I add something? Sure, please. Um, yeah, so the call schedule is one thing. Maybe monthly is is, is good, but I, I think we need to talk about like you know what's the project otherwise also, because I see that there's like you know potential to come out with some concrete things and actual RFCs in relatively soon if we scope them properly. But then there's also like more long term, almost like permanent research projects that you know what's the what's the current state of this or that. And, and it would be useful if you try and separate that and a little bit. That, that's part of the reason why I was saying that I would like to start splitting the drafts up a little bit. I don't know what other people think about this. But... So there's some plus ones, uh, for, plus one from Watson to, to Yari, I think. Uh, Wendy has to leave. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. So maybe. Uh, so we having some meetings uh, at a cadence of monthly-ish uh, seems reasonable. We can set up some polls, and pick times, and so on. Uh, Yari, maybe in terms of your, you know, setting out a, a sketch of the future or something. Maybe we can try and construct an email and send it to the list that that is a bit more concrete on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. OK, so then uh, I guess that puts an action on Yari and I to try and send a craft a mail sent to the list um, suggesting what we might aim for between now and November, as opposed to how often we meet. And, and also, we'll cover how often we meet. OK, uh, any other uh, planning type issues? I don't see anybody in the queue. I assume not. And if not, uh, we're on to the any other business part of the agenda. So is anybody got any other business? Uh, lunch for some. Um, indeed, please add yourself to the participant list in the Etherpad, which is on screen there now. Um, and if there's no other business other than lunch, enjoy your lunch. Uh, I hope everybody keeps well, and uh, we'll talk on the list and have another chat like this in mid to end May. So thanks very much, and good evening, chaps. Bye.
Thank you.